Let me give you another example that might be a little bit more difficult to grapple with. And that is the perspective of whose gaze, G-A-Z-E, whose perspective determines the perspective of society. And uh, Willie Jennings talks about the four quadrants of relationship, a four-part relationship between the white male, the black male, the white female, and the black female. And that interrelationship between these four oftentimes is determined by the gaze or perspective of the white male. In other words, how the white male views the others determines how the rest of society views the other. So for example, when the white male gazes upon the black male, how is that black male perceived? The black male is perceived in such a way that the rest of society views the black male in the same way. So when the white male sees the black male, that black male is a threat. In fact, if you think about the six o'clock news and what leads every single news report in the six o'clock local news, what is the most scary, threatening person in our society, according to the six o'clock news? It is the unidentified black male. Today on the north side of Chicago, an unidentified black male locked o knocked over a liquor store. Today on the west side of Chicago, an unidentified black male was involved in a gang shooting. Today on the south side of Chicago, an unidentified black male was involved in a drive-by. This unidentified black male is approximately 15 to 45 years old, weighs anywhere from 150 to 300 pounds, and is anywhere from five foot eight inches to six foot eight inches tall. If you have seen such a black male, you must report him immediately because this unidentified black male is a threat to your neighborhood. That is some of the narratives that get embedded into our society. Now, that threat of the black male is translated in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways it's translated is the gaze issue again, the perspective. When the black male looks at the white female, that is oftentimes conceived as a very real threat. This was noticed very recently at an incident in Central Park where an African-American bird watcher is literally bird watching. And he is uh, uh, confronted by a white female who calls the police on him and is very clear to identify, I am afraid of a black male, an African-American male. And so that perspective of the white female is being uh, threatened by the black male, that makes that person even more of a threat. We know this in history. One of the most tragic stories in American history is the lynching of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was a 17-year-old teenage kid from Chicago, goes down to the South on summer vacation, and he goes to hang out with extended family. He is accused of whistling at or speaking to or looking at a white woman. By the way, on her deathbed, she claimed, actually, this never really happened. But she, he's accused of that. And that simple accusation gave permission for Emmett, Lynn, Emmett Till to be lynched, to be brutalized. And it's one of those historical moments that we realize that the black male, no matter how young, 17 years old, is conceived as a threat. You can be a 17 year old with just a hoodie and you're a threat because you are an unidentified black male. You can be 12 years old playing in a playground in Cleveland and you are the unidentified black male. And so even a 12 year old is considered to be a threat. These are the narratives that have gotten embedded into our society, into our story, and we react out of those narratives. I wanna give you an example about what narratives are. Narratives are like a good actor in a good TV show or in a movie. So there are good actors who use something called method acting. In method acting, what they do is they embody the character so deeply that they reflexively and improvisationally, impulsively act out of that character. So for example, if Robert De Niro is playing a mobster in a, in a movie shoot and you run into him at a Starbucks, don't talk to him because he's so into that character, he'll respond to you like he's an actual mobster. So that embodied character, that getting so deeply into that character that your instinct, your reflex, what you improvise comes out of that character, that's what narratives do. And so if these narratives have been played out over and over again, the unidentified black male, the superiority of white culture over other cultures, the, the, the demeaning of other cultures and the elevating of this culture. When that narrative gets played out over and over again, we end up embedding that character into our imagination, our value system, our worldview, and we act improvisationally, instinctively, reflectively, reflexively out of that character. One of the questions we want to grapple with as we go through this material 
is what are the ways that we act instinctively to preserve that narrative of white superiority, white primacy? Uh, primacy? What are the ways we act naturally, instinctively, to preserve or to act into that narrative of white superiority? 